All right, so in Nehemiah chapter 2, basically what I'm going to be doing is kind of going over, we're going to be looking at a lot of scripture in the book of Nehemiah. We're going to be um, reading a lot about the work. It's kind of going to be a summary over, of the overall book of Nehemiah. We're going to be digging into some of these chapters. But what I'm, the, the topic that I want you to keep in mind tonight, and the main focus and the main goal of the sermon, is to maintain our commitment in the face of adversity. Nehemiah, we see here in chapter number 2, he gets it in his heart to, to repair Jerusalem. Now, this is after the children of Israel obviously had been taken captive by the Babylonians. This is, this is when um, they were looking to go back from their captivity. The temple had been destroyed. Jerusalem had been destroyed. The walls had been knocked down. The, the whole city was, was, has just been wasted and just destroyed when they were overtaken. But Nehemiah gets it in his heart to rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild those walls, to, to make Jerusalem great again, to make Jerusalem a place of, of, that would be a godly city where the, where the children of Israel can look back to the Lord and, and go back to trusting in God, the Lord, for their salvation and for their guidance and for their direction and for everything else that they had forsaken when they were, got judged and were taken captive out of their city. So he gets this in his heart and he's kind of sad about it. He's thinking about it and it grieves him that Jerusalem's in such a state and he's serving the king. And the king questions him on it. He says, well, wait a minute. You're not sick. So why, why is your countenance sad? Why, why do you look like you're sad? And at first, Nehemiah is kind of scared because, you know, he's not one to probably let his emotions show on the job or at work that he wants, you know, the king to be asking about his welfare since he's the servant. He's serving the king. And, you know, the king asks him this. And I love what it says here. This isn't in my notes. It says, he says in the end of verse 2, Then I was sore afra afraid and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste and the gates are ever consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make? Where he says, well, Okay, well, what do you want? All right, he's saying, he asked him first, Why are you sad? He's, Well, I'm sad because, you know, my, my hometown, my city is just lying waste. You know, everything's destroyed. So the king then asks him, okay, well, what's your request? What do you want to do about it? And I love how Nehemiah responds. It says, first, so I prayed to the God of heaven. So he has this great opportunity that's just opened up in front of him where the king is asking him, okay, you have an opportunity now to make your request. You're sad about this. This is grieving you in your heart. Well, what do you want to do about it? The first thing he does, he prays to God, and then he opens up his mouth. Verse 5 says, And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. So he asks him and said, Hey, well, I, want, I would like to rebuild the city. I would like to, to build it back up again because it's lying waste. He's not sitting there and just complaining and crying about it at this point. I mean, he has the initial grief, but he also has the desire to do something about it. God has worked it in his heart. He prays to God. God gives him the answer. He says, well, I want to go. I want to rebuild. And because God was with him, because it was a work that God approved of, the king says, okay. He says, what do you need? And he gives them supplies and he, and, he, and he sends them off and he gives them the instruction to the governors, the, the rulers that are over on the other side, that they would allow this work to, to be completed and that they would, you know, that he has been basically commissioned to do this work. And the way that I'm going to be applying this and what I want you to be thinking about as we read through the story is, you know, Christianity today, that the, the, the city of Jerusalem was the, the you know, the, the place where the Lord had his name in the temple, that was like the, supposed to be the great lighthouse for the world. 
and people had rejected God. The Jews ended up, you know, going after false gods and idols and God's judgment came upon them. But this was a place that, that was once glorious, that once did, where they were living righteously and they, they were following God's laws. And this was the place, this was the center where it all happened. And it's sad to see that destroyed. It's sad to see that, that broken down. But instead of just wasting all your time grieving about it, Nehemiah decided, you know what? I want to build that back up again. Why can't we rebuild the greatness of Jerusalem? Why can't we make this a place again where we could go and say, you know, the, the children of Israel are serving the Lord? A lot of people will take a look at Christianity today and you have this, this false idea, false concept of, uh, of uh, um, dispensational beliefs. And they'll look at the, the churches in Revelations 2 and 3 and they'll say that, you know, these are all different church ages instead of actually specific churches that were being, that letters were being written to. And they'll say, we're in the Laodicean age and, and churches are all just lukewarm and it's just this, well, that's just the way it is and nothing can be done about it. Instead of having that type of an attitude, we need to have a Nehemiah type of an attitude. We say, you know what, maybe there are a lot of lukewarm churches out there. Maybe there are a lot of Christians that, aren't, that don't have a backbone, that aren't standing up, that aren't doing what's right, but what are you going to do about it? Let's rebuild the greatness of, you know, fundamentalism. Let's rebuild the greatness of people who love the Lord and want to serve Him and want to, and, and simply believe and are willing to obey the words that are written in this book. Not to make excuses for them. Not to twist their meaning to say, to, to say they mean something else, to be more accepted by the world. But people are willing to say, you know what? Nope, this needs to be done. There's a great, it's a great work ahead of us. Rebuilding an entire destroyed city, that's a great work. That's what Nehemiah had to look at. And when he goes out, he doesn't tell anyone about it at first and he just kind of goes and surveys the scene. He goes out, he looks... He, he, he kind of goes around the city, takes an analysis, takes it all in, saying, okay, we've got the, you know, we've got the walls are destroyed here. You know, we've got all this other damage here. And, and he goes kind of around and sees everything that's broken down and the gates and, and everything that's been burned with fire and figuring out exactly, you know, making a plan of attack, a plan, how are we going to rebuild this? How are we going to do this? What all needs to be done? You know, we need to, to remove some of this rubble, remove this debris, and, and get this back into a place where we can, we can have it established again. So he checks it all out, and he says, it's first he didn't tell anybody about it. He didn't even tell the Jews. He didn't tell anyone that was going to be doing the work with them. He just goes to get it some information to check it out. But then he, uh, he lets them know what's going to happen. And his very first facing of, of adversity, and these are going to be the same people that are, that are causing him problems throughout this whole work, as we'll see. Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem. It says in verse 19, But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? So they just start mouthing off and just saying, Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, you plan on rebuilding this. What, are you going to rebel against the king because you're going to rebuild your city and then all of a sudden you're going to you know, be rebellious against the king? When... At this point, we don't even know if they, they probably don't even realize the king's the one that, that is allowing Nehemiah to go and do this work. But they're just making a big joke out of it. They're mocking. They're ridiculing. And, you know, at the beginning of a big project, at the beginning of a big work, and you can even apply this in your personal life. I've seen this happen to a lot of people. Well, after you get saved, it happens to pretty much almost everybody. Once you decide to say, you know what, no, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to start doing what's right. One of the first things that happens from usually your family or friends, it's going to be a lot of mocking, a lot of ridicule. Oh, what are you going to do? Oh, oh yeah, you're going to quit drinking? Yeah, okay. Oh, you're going to, you know. And 
Look, let's be honest, when you first get saved, usually a lot of people have a lot of work ahead of them. They have a lot of cleaning up that they have to do. They may have had a lot of sin in their life, and it's a big project, and it's a big task that they're going to under undertake of trying to get right with God and trying to do things that are going to be glorifying, and, and they're going to be a way of a, an example that a Christian ought to live and hold themselves to a much higher standard than they have in the past. And people might hear that and scoff and mock and laugh and ridicule and say, oh yeah, right. Oh, what are you going to do? Oh, you're going to be a Christian now? What, are you going to be a Bible thumper? And they'll call you names. This is what happens. This is a common attack that happens at the onset of a great work. The same thing happens when men go out to start churches. You'll hear... You'll hear attacks, you hear people mocking and ridiculing, oh, what, oh, you're going to be meeting in your house, oh, yeah, you think anyone's going to want to come and meet in the house, oh, you think, you know, and just give you a hard time about it when, you, when you're starting off a great work. Now, what we have to realize is it is a great work, but it's worth working for. Look at what it says in verse 18. When Nehemiah tells the people who's going to be working with him, he says, then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. The people were excited. There's a lot of people out there that want to do good. They want to work. They're waiting for the right leader to come along. Nehemiah was that leader. He comes in. He had it in his heart. And he wasn't, you know, I'm sure a lot of these people, all these people he's talking to, they were grieved that Jerusalem was destroyed, that this city was, was, was beaten down and it was razed and it was burnt, but they weren't doing anything about it. But when the right person comes along who says, you know what, no, I, I am going to do something about it and is willing to undertake a great work, hey, that gets the people excited, that gets the people energized. And you know what, honestly, that's another reason why this church is here. I'm looking for the people who are upset about the way that Christianity is going. We're looking for the people who are sick and tired of the, the liberalism, the compromise, and everything else that is going wrong and that is destroying Baptists, that is destroying Christianity, that is destroying believers, and is destroying the name that they once had. We need to rebuild that, but it's going to be a lot of work. And with that work is going to come adversity. Any good task is going to come with adversity, the first thing that they do is they'll mock you. They'll ridicule you. So we're not going to go through chapter 3. Basically, in chapter 3, it talks about all the people that are getting involved. Everybody's getting involved in this great project. And they start building. They start repairing. They start doing the work. And they list off all of these different people that get involved and all the different work that they're doing. And you have these people over here and they're fixing this part of the city. And these people over there and they're fixing that part of the city. And everyone's excited and everybody's working. Jump down to, uh, jump over to chapter 4. We're going to see what happens next. Chapter 4, verse number 1, the Bible reads, But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. So here we see him actually getting angry because now he sees, hey, they're starting to do this work. At first it was just a big joke to him, right? And they try to discourage him. Just, oh yeah, whatever. Yeah, you're going to build this. What, are you going to rebel against the king? And now they see him doing the work and it makes him angry. It makes him mad. It makes him full of wrath. Because they actually see the work starting to be done. And look, the adversary is going to do this to you when you start to actually do the good work. It's going to make people angry. They're going to be mad at you. And it never ceases to amaze me when you could have so-called professed Christians that will start to get angry and mock and ridicule you when you do something like, say, go out soul winning when you want to go out and start, and start knocking on doors and then you actually start doing it and then you actually start seeing some results and you're excited about it and you think that other people would be excited about it too. But is that always what happens? No. There's always people, there's always adversaries that are going to say, they're going to mock you for it. 
Oh, what? You think, yeah, you think those people got saved? Oh, you think they, they just said a prayer, right? Now they're saved, right? Ha, ha, ha. Where were they? Did they come to church? What are you doing? And you have all the naysayers and all the mockers. Now, most of that comes just because, you know what? They're not doing anything. And the sin, their own sin comes back to them. It's haunting them that someone else is doing something, that someone else is being more righteous for them. So out of their pride, they want to try to bring you down a notch and just make, you, make it seem like, oh yeah, the work you're doing, it's really not working. It's really not what you're supposed to be doing. Where that person's doing nothing. But they want to bring you down because it makes them look bad that you're actually out doing something. They'll mock you. They'll ridicule you. Verse number two. It says, And he spake before his brethren, and the armies of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Look at, and this is, this is um, Sanballat talking, right? He's talking to his people. And he's saying, What are these feeble Jews? Look at these weaklings. What are these weak Jews doing? What are they thinking? And he's casting them down and using every method he can to just demean them and demoralize them. And he's saying, look, they're weak. He said, will they fortify themselves? Are they going to build up you know, a, a fortification here? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? They're saying, what, are they actually going to do this thing? Are they actually going to, to rebuild this? And he's, kind of he's still mocking them because the destru destruction was so great. And they don't appreciate, they didn't have the same vision that the children of Israel did. They just, they just kind of blow them off. But not completely blowing them off because they're still attacking them. They don't want this to happen. They're angry about it. So they're using this tactic of demoralization, of just saying, oh yeah, these, these weak Jews, they can't do anything. How could they possibly fortify themselves? Verse 3 says, Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him. And he said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. So they start making jokes. They're like, oh yeah, look, they're trying to build this wall. Even if a, if a little animal, if a little fox were to go and climb up on that wall, it's just going to crumble. It's just going to fall down. They can't do, they can't build this work, you know, and they're, they're using um, this type of a tactic against them to demoralize them. Verse four says, hear, O our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity and cover not their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So now we see here Nehemiah's answer to all of their despite, to all of their attacks and all of their um, railing on the Jews. He prays to God. He doesn't fight with them. He doesn't answer them with all their mockery and with all their you know, um, indignation and wrath that they have against them. No, he prays to God. He says, look, God, we're despised. We're hated of these people. We're doing your work, God. We're obeying you. We're listening. We're doing what you want us to do. But we're despised. So he says, turn their reproach upon their own head. The, the, the reproaches that they're giving us, God, you make it so that it comes back upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. He says, And cover not their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. For they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Verse 6, So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. For the people had a mind to work. This reminds me of Jesus saying, you know, pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he'll send laborers. We need more workers. When the people have a mind to work, you can accomplish a lot. There is a lot that can be done for Christ. There is a lot that can be done to the glory of God when the people have a mind to work. We need more people that have this type of a mind, this type of an attitude, this type of a vision where we're willing to sacrifice, we're willing to put in the effort and the work. It is work. It's a lot easier to spend your free time hanging out, going, doing some entertainment, going out camping, doing whatever it is that you like to do 
just to relax. I'm not preaching against having some time to relax or some time to rest, some time to get your, you know, your bearings or spend some time with your family. I'm not, I'm not against that. But is that all you do with your free time? And by free time, I mean when you're not actually working you know, as a husband to provide for the family or as a wife to provide you know, the, the, um, what she needs to do within the house and running the household. Are you willing to, to put forth the time and effort into a project, into a greater cause, into work for the Lord? Sit still. Do you have that mind to work? We're going to see when this is all accomplished how much was actually done and in such a short period of time because the people had a mind to work. We'll see what, what that is when we get to the end of this. But so far we've just seen the mocking and the ridiculing and the despising and these words being spoken against them. But as the work continues... And as they actually start to accomplish more and more, and they're doing more to get this task done, sit down. The mocking turns into a plan to actually physically stop them. Look at verse number 7 in Nehemiah 4 where we're at. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth. They start getting angry. They start to hear, wait a minute. The walls actually are going up. And the breaches, the holes, they're filling them up. This is actually being done. They got real angry about this. They said, wait a minute. No, this isn't going to happen. Verse number 8, and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. They said, you know what? We're not going to let this happen. We're not going to stand for it. That wall's not going back up. So they conspired to gather together and they were going to fight against Jerusalem so that they can hurt the cause of the wall being built. Verse number 9 says, Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God. So again, do you see the pattern of the attacks coming against Nehemiah, the attacks coming against the people who are working on this great project for God? And what, how do they answer it? First thing they do, they pray to God. But our prayer is unto God. They're going to God with all their problems and all their troubles and set a what? But it doesn't just stop there. Right? The first thing is always pray to God. But you also need to be doing things. And it says, and they set a watch against them day and night because of them. So they're praying unto God and they trust in God to deliver them. But they're also setting up a watch so they can look out for them. Because they're, they're wise to this. Verse number 10 and Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. So what they're saying is, you know, there's still a lot of rubbish, there's a lot, there's a lot of garbage in the way, and the, the way that they're working, they're not even going to be able to see us coming, is what they're saying. We're going to be able to destroy them. We're gonna, we're, they're not going to see us until we're among them, and we're going to kill them and cause their work to stop. Verse 12, And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. So they keep on warning them, telling them, look, they're going to come upon you. Therefore said I, verse 13, Therefore said I, in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. He's real wise about this. He sets the people up right by their individual families. Because you know what? When it comes down to it, it people who might not be willing to go off to a battle to fight someone else's war, when it comes down to you defending your household and your family, you're going to fight. And you're going to fight like you've never fought before to protect your own family 
to protect your own brethren. And he sets everyone up and he gives them their swords. And he says, but he says, first of all, look, don't be afraid of these people. Don't be afraid of the adversary. Don't be afraid of these people who are threatening to come in and kill you to stop your work. Don't be afraid of them. Remember God. Remember the Lord, it says, which is great and terrible. God is great and God is terrible. Terrible means he's able to instill terror and make people very, very, very afraid because of his might and his power. He says, don't forget God. God is on our side. We are building this work for the Lord. He is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid when they threaten to kill you. And you know what? Oftentimes that happens as well. People get death threats. I know Pastor Anderson has got many, many death threats. People who are standing up and doing a great work for the Lord get these types of threats. But that can't make you back down. When you are serving God out of a pure heart and you're doing the work that He has set up for you to do, we cannot back down and cause the work to stop because people are threatening you. We need to stand strong. And I praise the Lord for people like him that don't back down, that won't get afraid and go run and hide and stop the great work and cause it to cease. Nehemiah says, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord and fight for your brethren your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. And in this spiritual fight that we have going on, you are fighting for your wife. You are fighting for your children. For the very culture and society that we live in, for them to grow up in a wholesome way. It's a serious fight. If you're undertaking the great task of, of maybe cleaning up your life or maybe doing even more for the Lord and you start getting these attacks, don't back down. People back down because they're afraid, for example, you know, that CPS is going to come and take their kids away because they spanked them, according to the way that the Bible says to raise your children. I'm not going to be afraid of them. I'm not going to, you know, change the way that I rear my children to be contrary to what the Bible says just because people are going to make threats. Now, should we be wise about it? Of course, but I'm not going to change the way that I serve the Lord and the way that I follow what God has for us to do, the work that we have to do because of threats. Verse 15, And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, which means to nothing. So when they hear this, when they hear, oh, they're ready for us. Oh, they know that we're going to come. When they hear that, it says that we return all of us to the wall, everyone unto his work. So when they heard, okay, well, we're not going to come up on them and surprise them to, to, to kill them because they're all ready for us. Then they call off their attack and they go right back to work. Verse 16, and it came to pass from that time forth. You say, okay, from now on that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the habergens, and the rulers were behind all the house of, of Judah. They which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side, and so builded. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. So he's saying, okay, here's how we're going to deal with this. This work needs to be done. And we're not going to let these people who are going to threaten us with violence stop us. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to keep working. But just to make sure, we're going to make sure we have our weapons with us right at our side. We're going to work. He say, he's basically saying, you know, one hand's doing the work and the other hand's on the weapon. One hand's on the gun is ready to, oh, you're going to come? Okay, we're ready for you. But we're not going to let even that threat stop our work. The work needs to move forward. We need people that have this type of a mind to do God's work. That won't let 
the ridicule, that won't let the threats get them out and cause them to stop working. Make adjustments. Do what you need to do. They adjusted here and said, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. It might slow them down a little bit, but they're ready for it and they're going to keep pushing forward and they're going to keep on moving and keep getting the job done. Let's flip over to chapter 6. Nehemiah chapter 6. Verse number 1 reads, Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein. Remember what we just saw, you know, they were building, but there were still holes, there were still breaches, there were still areas where it wasn't completed yet. Well, now we're to the point in chapter 6, the wall has been built. Okay, the breaches are closed. The wall is up. It's as though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. The only thing that's left to do is to, is to put the doors in place. The wall is already there. It's just the, the doors on the gates that needed to be set up. Verse 2 that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. So they go after the head. They go after Nehemiah. Right? Nehemiah is the one who's leading this great task, who's leading this charge. And oftentimes, unfortunately, you know, when, when someone can take the leader out, the people end up getting scattered. Right? The people don't really know what to do, and oftentimes that can stop a task from being completed, which is why we need more leaders. But they see here, they go straight to Nehemiah. They say, come, let us meet together. You know, let's, let's, let's talk about this. In one of the villages in this, in this other place, they're not going to come and meet with them there where he's safe. They're gonna, they want him to say, come on over here and talk with us. Verse 3, And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? So he's saying, look, I'm busy, man. I'm not going to come down to you. I'm not going to talk to you about this. And who are these people? These people were rulers. Sanballat, Tobiah, you know, Geshem. They were their enemies, but they were, they were also people in positions of authority. And he says, I, I've got too much stuff going on. Okay, I'm busy. I'm not going to be sidetracked with you. And then this whole work stops because I'm gone talking to you guys. And we need to make sure that we don't get distracted with too many things with the enemy trying to pull us away from the work that we're doing. Verse number four. Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort. So they're, they're not giving up. Four times. And I answered them after the same manner. Now look, you may be strong enough to say the first time, you know, when, when a distraction comes along, no, no, I'm busy, I have too much stuff going on. When it comes repeatedly, you need to stay strong. You need to be able to answer them after the first manner like Nehemiah did so that the work, when you're, when you're working on things, you can actually get the task accomplished so that people aren't drawing your attention away doing all kinds of other things. And the, especially when the enemy comes and trying to get you away. Now, you might not always be aware that the enemy is trying to do this and we're going to see this. Um, quickly what happens here. Let's just keep reading. Verse 5, Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time, so five times, with an open letter in his hand, wherein was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu hath said it, or saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. And now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. So now they're bringing up a false report and a false witness against Nehemiah, and they're trying to snare him. They're trying to trap him. But think about it, if there was ever a reason to go, you, know, you might get a little bit scared out of fear, say, well, wait a minute, no, 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 that's not what's going on here. I need to set the record straight. You know, when people are lying about you, people are lying about Nehemiah and they're saying, okay, well, look, you know, this is what this guy's saying. He's saying that you're going to rebel against the king and that you're going to have prophets say, hey, there's a king in Judah and it's Nehemiah and, now, you know, and, and you're going to rebel against the king. Well, we're going to go to the king with this unless you come down here and just get this whole matter straightened out. 
You know, let's just verify everything here and, and you can you know, answer for yourself this claim made against you. And that would be a, that's a very tempting snare to run into. It's very tempting to try to, to justify yourself and try to write and say, no, 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 that's not what's going on. Let me clear the air. But that's exactly what they're trying to get him to do. It's a trap. There are going to be, and look at what, how he answers in verse 8. It says, Then I said, un, sent unto, them, unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. He's saying, That is not true. You're making it up. Out of your own heart, you're just making it up. And that's all he had to do. He didn't have to go down there in person and settle it. He just sent him, sent him a letter and or just sent a messenger unto him and said, Look, that's not true. And you're faking it. You know, we need to be wise like this, like Nehemiah was, not to get distracted from the work at hand in order to answer every false claim. This is something that's very easy to do on the internet with people these days. A lot of people will go around and be making false accusations and spreading lies about you. And, you know, it's easy to get caught up in this and have to feel like, no, I need to write this wrong. You know, this person lied about me. I need to set the record straight. That person lied about me. I need to set the record straight. And look, if you get caught up in that, it's never going to end. And you're going to end up wasting all of your time trying to defend yourself against these liars, against these people who are literally just trying to, to set a trap for you. One, so they can at least trap you in your words or just so you can waste your time and the work that you should be focused on isn't getting done because you're, you're distracted in defending yourself. Look, let God be the revenger. You could, if you're walking upright, you have nothing to worry about when people lie against you. Let them lie. You, know, you can answer it briefly, just say, that ain't true. You're lying. But you don't have to, to devote your time into answering all these false claims. Remember how the Jews were always trying to trap Jesus and, tra and catch him in his words. They're always bringing him these questions and trying to get him to say something. You know, and they're always trying to lay a snare and a trap for him. And there's all these accus there accusations against Jesus Christ saying, oh, well, you know, he's trying to make himself a king. And that's what they said unto Pilate, you know, well, if you, you know, if you let him free, you're not Caesar's friend because he's claiming to be a king. And these were the false accusations that they were bringing against him. Now, Jesus didn't, and you know what, when, he was, when all the false accusations were brought up against him, he didn't say anything. He didn't have to. He was innocent. We don't need to get caught up in that whole sidetrack of, uh, of things that, that you know, people are going to do it no matter what because they're wicked and because they're trying to get you to stop doing the work that you're doing. And even engaging those people oftentimes, it's, it's, it's weird, but can make you lose your credibility. Not necessarily, but you know, when you're even engaging and, and even allowing it to be like a valid, you know, when, when, when people say a lot of ridiculous things, I just don't even answer it because it doesn't even deserve a response because it's ridiculous, because it's completely unfounded. And there's no reason to answer those things. And once you start, start doing it, it gives a little bit of credibility to the person who's even bringing up the accusation to begin with. Don't, don't be deceived in, into, that, um, <clears throat> into that tactic of getting you to stop working. Let's keep reading here in Nehemiah 6. Look at verse number 9. The Bible reads, For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Look at all the prayer to God. Continually, while people are, are coming against them, trying to get this work to stop, ridiculing, mocking them, you know, trying to set all these traps for them. You may, you may get afraid. You know, when the threats come, you may be afraid. You need to trust in the Lord and trust in God as your strength and ask God to strengthen your hands to continue to do that work. Verse number 10, Afterward I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehedabiel, who was shut up. And he said, Let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. 
Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. So here's somebody that's like on the inside, right? This is someone that says he's Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehedabiel. And he's saying, let's go into the house of God. Let's go and hide out in the temple. He's like, well, shut the doors because they're coming to kill you. They're going to come try to assassinate you. Let's go hide in the temple. And it's a fear tactic, again. But this is coming from someone on the inside. This is not coming from someone that's, you know, that's the known enemy. This is an unknown enemy. Now, what I want to point out here, you know, with all this fear, 2 Timothy 1.7 reads, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. God has not given you the spirit of fear. When people come, even someone who's going to say, you know, they're, they're out to kill you, we don't need to be afraid of that. We know that God is with us if we're doing His will, if we're doing His work. God's going to be with you. God has given us the spirit of power. God has given us the spirit of love and of a sound mind, a rational, sound mind. That we don't need to start making our decisions based on fear and running and hiding and stopping the work. That's how they're trying to win. They're trying to scare you. And this guy even gets in. This guy was, was not the known enemy. He was actually uh, uh, one of the prophets, right? And um, he's telling him to go hide, in, hide in, the, uh, in the temple. We need to be careful which prophets we're listening to. God didn't send this guy, even though he claimed to be speaking from the Lord. Look at what the Bible says in, in verse 11 of Nehemiah 6. Nehemiah answers them, and, and I said, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there that, being as I am, would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. He's saying, you think someone like me is going to go run and hide in the temple? He's like, I'm not going to go hiding. I'm not going to go into hiding and be scared and run away and be afraid. I'll, I'm willing to face the enemy. Verse 12, and lo, I perceived that God had not sent him. He's saying, and I, I realize this. I understood God didn't send him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me. For Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. So he was a prophet. He was, he was preaching a prophecy against Nehemiah. Because his enemies, Tobiah and Sanballat, he hired them. They gave this guy money to preach this message unto Nehemiah to get into his ear, to cause him to fear, to cause the work to stop. Verse 13, Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so and sin and that they might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. They are looking for any way that they can attack Nehemiah at this point to attack this leader of the great work. And if you're a leader, look out for this. If you're doing a, a big work for, for God, these attacks will come your way too. We need to be wise to these attacks. The enemy is always looking for a way to tarnish your good name. Now when the attacks come, we shouldn't be ignorant of these devices. They will try to attack a weakness in your flesh. Now, everybody has to some degree a weakness of fear, right? The, the attacks coming against you. Someone's going to take your life. Someone's going to take your kids. You know, someone's going to do this or do that to you. And they use a fear-based tactic because everybody as a human being has somewhat of, a, of, you know, of that type of emotion that we need to keep in check and we need to keep in balance with our faith that God is with us. We don't have that fear. God doesn't give us that spirit of fear, but we have to be mindful of that so we don't fall into this trap of being afraid. Or they may lie to you, like this prophet did that, that just came out and lied and said, oh yeah, God said this. No, God didn't say that. Or they'll cause you to doubt. And I'm sure that, you know, what they're trying to do is, is cause them to, to start to think, wait a minute, 
Should I put this work on hold? Should I wait? Should I, should I, you know, if this threat's real, should I just go into hiding and then come back and finish the work? You know, and they'll cause you to doubt what they're doing. That's their goal is to make you doubt. Or maybe they'll even entice you with some other carnal desire, some other desire of your flesh, whether it be, you know, if you're a man with the, the enticement of a, of a female or something else, some way they think they could get to you. Because if they could bring you down, especially as a leader, as a man, if they could bring you down, and tarnish your name, then they could get the work to cease. Because ultimately, that's what they're trying to do. <clears throat> we need to be aware of these attacks so that you could stand strong. Look at verse 14. The Bible reads, My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. So you're saying, God, remember these people. Look, at that's a lot of people. Tobias, Sanballat, this Noadiah prophetess, and the rest of the prophets. Who knows how many that is, but it's plural. Right? All of these people are trying to get Nehemiah to fear. There's a lot of people say, oh, well, what if you're wrong? What if God doesn't want you doing that? And they'll try to get you a doubt, and they'll try to get you to fear. Let's let God deal with those people as Nehemiah did. He says, my God, think thou upon them for their works, for what they're doing to try to stop this work that we're doing for you. There were a lot of people against this great work that we're reading about in Nehemiah. Look at verse 15. The Bible reads, So the wall was finished, look at this, in the 20 and 5th day of the month Elul, in 50 and 2 days, and it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes. For they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. The people had a mind to work. The people didn't let fear stop them. The people didn't let the ridicule stop them. They continued and pushed on no matter what they had to do in the, the face of adversity. They stuck with it and accomplished, oh, so great a task of rebuilding the wall. In 52 days. 52 days. That's not that long. Think about it. That's just shy of three months. And they built wall, this entire wall around the city. But they had a lot of helpers. They had a lot of workers. It was a great, ta it was so great. I mean, they didn't even think, you know, these, th their enemies didn't even think it was possible. They're saying, yeah, whatever. You think you're going to build this wall. Ha ha. Yeah, because there's so much work to be done. But when the people had a mind to work, when they were real willing to, to pitch in, when they were willing to do their part, when they had a great leader, when they had people who weren't afraid, they made a major accomplishment. And then we end up seeing ultimately the, the rebuilding of the temple and bringing things back and trying to bring things back to the way that they were before. We have a great work in front of us in this church, in this, in this area, and in Christianity as a whole. There's a lot of work. We need people that have a mind to work, that aren't going to fear, that aren't going to, to be shaken in the face of adversity. Because let's be honest, the adversity comes. The Bible says, Yea, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Everybody that is going to do work for the Lord you're going to face persecution. You're going to face adversity. How are you going to deal with that? Are you going to run and hide? Are you going to stop working? The worst thing that you can do is quit. You can't back out of this. We need to keep pushing forward. Look, rely on the strength of the Lord. God will bring the victory. If, you are, if God be for us, who can be against us? It doesn't matter if the world is against you. If you are involved in doing this great work, you have nothing to worry about. You have nothing to fear. 
But get involved with the work. What do I mean by that now? What do I mean by the work? Well, the work can be a lot of things. How about the work of getting the sin and wickedness out of your life to start with? That's a lot of work. That's a great accomplishment to get a lot of that sin out of your life. But don't stop there. What about the work that the church is doing? How about helping to build the church, helping to grow the church, helping to do, you know, to... to be a servant unto others. How about going out and winning souls? That is a great work and a great task that's never done. Preaching the gospel. Not just going out the door, but what about people in your daily life? What about people at the grocery store? What about people at the gas station? What about people that you run into? Is it work? Yes, it's work and it's going to take your time. But are you just going to ignore all the work so that you can sit on Facebook all day? Are you going to ignore the work so you can play video games? Are you going to ignore the work so you can take naps? Are you going to ignore the work so you can do all these other things and then say, well, I don't have any time to serve God? The choice is yours, but look, with this morning sermon, the reason why we're in the state we're in is because people aren't doing the work. Because people are afraid. People are back down and being spineless against the, the sodomite agenda and against the, the whole liberal think tank out there of people that are, that are trying to call Christianity hate. And nobody seems to be standing up. Very few. Very few. Are you scared of the adversity? You ought not to be. Don't let the people bring fear into your, into your life when you're serving God and you're doing a great work for His name. Stand strong. Stay steadfast. Unmovable. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You so much for these great words of encouragement, this great story about Nehemiah. He was such a, a great leader, dear Lord. I pray that You would please... Um, Send more leaders like Nehemiah into our churches that can lead a, a great people to do great works for your name, dear God. That we can try to stem the tide of, of, of this wickedness, dear Lord. That there can be some form, some sort of, of reviving of, of uh, people being brought back to, to Christian values and to Christian morals, dear Lord, and to... And to um, giving reverence and respect unto the Bible and to your commandments, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to reach the lost and to, to change lives, dear Lord, and to get people on fire to serve you, that, that they would have a mind to work and that we could really get this thing to grow. Lord, I pray that you would please just strengthen us. Help us not to be beaten down. Help us not to be fearful, dear Lord. Help us not to doubt the great work that we've undertaken to do and that you would help us to remain steadfast and unmovable, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.